large signal, but uh, no voice contact yet. We're standing by. At 10.36 this morning, Apollo 8 went round the far side of the moon at just over 7,000 miles an hour into a complete radio blackout that was to last 47 minutes. In that radio blackout, they were to ignite their main rocket engine and fire it backwards if they were to slow down and go into moon orbit. And then, at 11.23, after 47 minutes of nail-biting silence, we heard this. Apollo Control, Houston, uh, we've acquired signal, but uh, no voice contact yet. We're standing by. Apollo Control, Houston, uh, we're looking at engine data, and it looks good. Uh, tank pressures look good. Uh, we have not talked yet with the crew, but uh, we're standing by. But we've got it. Uh, we've got it. Apollo... Uh, Eight now in in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a cheer in the, this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Level. By 60.5. Good to hear your voice. So there they are, successfully in orbit. And at this particular moment in time, <clears throat> they're beginning the second of their elliptical orbits before they fire again to go into the last eight circular orbits. They're just 69 miles above the surface of the moon at this point on the dark side. They've been in blackout, radio blackout, on the other side of the moon now since nine minutes to one. And when they come out later on in this program, they'll be sending, we hope, live television transmissions from 69 miles above the surface of the moon. And with me in the studio, Patrick Moore. Hello. And, hello, Patrick. And we hope to get on to... Ah, there, there is Sir Bernard Lovell at Jodrell Bank. Mm -hmm. And the, these gentlemen will be commenting and watching with us as those pictures come down. Gentlemen, I'd just like you to listen, if you would, to this tape of the first ever recorded description by a human voice of the moon's surface as Jim Lovell passed over it for the first time 69 miles up. Paul 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray. <coughs> no color. Looks like plaster of Paris. Or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the sea of fertility doesn't stand out as well here as it does back on Earth. There's not as much contrast between that and the surrounding craters. Uh, the crater craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. Well, Ingridus is quite a huge crater. It's got a central cone to it. The walls of the crater are, are terraced. Uh, about uh, six or seven different terraces on the way down. Uh, Roger, understand. And coming up now, the Sea of Fertility are the old friends Messier and Vickery that I looked about so much on Earth. Uh, Roger. And I can see the rays coming out of uh, Blaze Vickery. We're coming up now near uh, our B1 initial site, which I'm going to try and see. Uh, be advised, the round window, the hatch window is completely iced over and we cannot use it. No matter showing the rendezvous window. Uh, Paul A. Houston, uh, Roger. Uh, got any more information on those rays, over? Uh, Roger, the rays out of uh, Pickering are uh, quite faint from here. There's, there are two different uh, groups coming to, uh, going to the west. Uh, they don't appear to be, uh, have any depth to them at all, just, uh, rays coming out. Roger. It looks like just changes in, uh, the color of the Mari. Yeah. Okay, over to my right are the, uh, Pyrene Mountains coming up. And, uh, we're just about over, uh, Messier and Pickering right now.
Well, Sir Bernard, <coughs> can you hear me, at Admiral Banks, Sir Bernard? Yes, good morning, Sir Bernard. Good morning, Sir Bernard. Did you manage to pick up Apollo as it came round for the first time this morning? No, we... Uh, when the moon came above our horizon this morning, uh, the Apollo was uh, on the hidden side of the moon, and we're hoping to get it uh, when it reappears in a few moments' time. You'll be lucky. I did hear that uh, description live, though, on the CBS line here, and I must confess, I thought it was really quite extraordinary. Sure, yes. One of the most remarkable few minutes that I've ever lived through, the realization that there was a human being there, only 60 or 70 miles above the lunar surface, giving that really quite wonderful description of what yes, he was indeed. seeing. Yes. Uh, Patrick Moore in the studio, what did uh, that description tell you, uh, if anything, new about uh, the moon and their position above it and which way up they were and so on? Well, we know where they are from the flight plan. You heard them say they were coming over Messier and Pickering at one stage, and these are two small craters on the Sea of Fertility. In fact, they're going right across the visible side of the moon, as seen from the Earth, and they're, as far as I can see, they must be looking south. That's down to the bottom of the chart that we've got here. So they're upside down? They're right? upside down, in fact. One thing I think is important to mention, uh, when they go around the other side of the moon, where they are at the present moment, and at this moment, remember, they are completely out of touch. There is no possible means of contacting them until they come back round the edge of the moon again. But the other side of the moon isn't necessarily dark. You see, the dark side of the moon is the side of the moon that's turned away from the sun, and that isn't always the side of the moon that's turned away from the earth. So day and night conditions on the side we can never see are precisely the same as those on the side we can see. But uh, that means that now, since he is describing what he's seeing, they must be going over a sector of the moon on this side that is lit also by the sun. Well, they were when they made that description, and at the present moment, of course, they still are, but they'll be coming around the edge very shortly. Of course, it's a fantastic thing, because they're seeing things that no men have ever seen before from close range. And although Though we've got pictures from the craft that have gone round the moon and craft that have landed there, this, when all is said and done, isn't the same as seeing it for oneself. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt that when they come back, the photographs they actually bring back, and we have processed in our laboratories, will tell us more about the moon than we've known before. Yes. Sir Bernard, may I ask one thing? When they come round on our side of the moon, are you able to track them across the moon's surface, or does the moon, as it were, distort their signal so much that you can't pick them up when they're between us and the moon? Uh, no trouble at all. Uh, the signals will only disappear when there's an actual occultation of the spacecraft by the moon. Uh, we're in the same position once the moon is above our horizon as any of the, any of the other tracking stations of this network. And in fact, uh, Sir Bernard, you lock on to the signal that is bringing us their voice, and that's how you track them, is that yes. not so? Yes, we can't. Of course, the decoding of the signals, particularly the television signals, is an extremely complicated business, and we're not part of the tracking network. We can decipher the voices, but not the television transmissions. I'm afraid we had to rely on the BBC for that. Apollo Control, Houston, 71 hours, 32 minutes, and now on the flight of Apollo 8. We're within uh, eight minutes of acquiring uh, the Apollo 8, uh, 8 uh, spacecraft. Uh, now on its second revolution around the moon, uh, which uh, the first revolution began at uh, uh, midpoint on the backside. Apollo 8 uh, should be yawing about uh, 45 degrees uh, uh, just about now to establish a proper attitude uh, for TV sighting. We'll continue to monitor as uh, I think what we Sir Bernard said there was most interesting. With his radio telescopes, he can in fact pick up Apollo as it goes around the moon, and the visual astronomers can't. And I don't think there's any telescope on Earth will actually show Apollo 8 at the present moment. So we have to rely upon the radio astronomers for this. Well, I, uh, may I ask one question that I think probably most people would, would like to know? If only part of the moon that is on our side is lit by the sun, then the other section, which is in shadow, shadowed presumably by the Earth, uh, is only lit by Earth shine. Well, in point of fact, you see, the Earth does shine upon the moon, and it shines on the moon much more brightly than the moon shines on the Earth, because the Earth's a bigger body than the moon, so it looks bigger when you're on the moon, and also it's a better reflector. The moon's a very poor reflector indeed, those rocks are pretty dark. But I don't think that the Earth shine upon the night side of the moon is going to be very significant. You might make out a certain amount of detail there, but it's not going to be very important, I think. But could the, could the optical telescopes then not pick up the spacecraft lit by the rays of the sun as it crossed that dark side of our part of the moon? Uh, no, I think this is out of the question. Don't forget, Apollo 8 is a pretty small thing, and you're just not going to be able to pick it up from Earth range. Yes.